I'd like to welcome you all here to the Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Pastor Marshall McKenzie from the Kentucky Tennessee Conference Office. And to my left is Pastor Roger uh, from the Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Roger, thank you so much for having us here. It is our pleasure to have you here. We've been looking forward to this for weeks, actually for months. Good to have you here. And Pastor Steve is also joining us, and I'm thankful so much that you're joining us. We're so glad that you chose our location to do this, and a special welcome to all the people who are watching us online. We are so glad that you are part of this large congregation today. Amen. You know, we want to encourage all of our churches, you're not alone. You're not out there alone. And so the goal of this live stream event is to encourage you and help you understand that you're a part of something big. God is doing something special in the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, and I believe that he's about to renew our churches because Jesus is coming soon. And uh, so I'm really excited that we're able to come here from the Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church and be a blessing to your church this Sabbath day. So the, the word renew, you know, we're focusing on one aspect this Sabbath in evangelism, but, you know, church growth is something that we all desire. It's something we all want because we all, I believe, want to accomplish God's mission. And in a simple way, what, what, how would you define, Pastor Steve, God's mission for his church in, in this day and in this age? Well, I don't know that our mission has changed much throughout all of Christian history. We are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and trust that he's with us always. Now, the method, that changes sometimes, but the mission stays the same. Isn't it funny how we sometimes get that so complicated? Really, if we just think back about the original commission, usually uh, we find ourselves on pretty good solid ground. Don't you think? That's good. That's exactly right. The first word here is to reflect, this word renew. And many times it's, it's important for us to remember the command that Jesus gave us and the importance of following through with that commission. Um, and there, are, there are so many great things that churches do that sometimes it's tempting to let that become who we are. And we forget to reflect on the original mission Jesus gave us of making disciples of all nations. All these things that we do are there in order to accomplish that goal. But if our focus gets on what we're doing instead of what our goal is, then we get off target. Right. So it's important to remember what Jesus gave us to do. It's also important to kind of remember... You know, Jesus actually kind of lays out some steps in that process. Yeah, you know, he talks about empowerment. He talks about the need to nurture. You know, if you have a flock, right, you want to be able to nurture and disciple that flock. He talks about the need to evangelize. This Sabbath, we're going to be talking about evangelism. Talk a lot about evangelism. A lot about evangelism. But uh, also witnessing, you know, that personal contact that we make with people in the community. Seeing people in the church get excited and passionate about some form of ministry, it really does, it gives me excitement. It really gives me courage to do what I do. I'm not in this alone, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, pastors need to be empowered too. And, and uh, you know, when, when we feel like that there's a congregation that wants to do something and wants to be a part of it and wants to make a contribution, it really does. It energizes me. It makes me want to get up and, you know, and, and shoot for higher goals. So I, I know you've probably experienced the same thing. That's right. And, and talking about empowering asking people, there's two sides to that coin. Of course, if you're a leader in the ministry, it's, it's important to be looking for people to involve. But if you're just sitting there saying, I wish I was doing something, or maybe the church doesn't trust me enough to ask me, maybe it's not that they don't trust you, it's that we're all human. We don't think everything. So go out and ask. Hey, can I be involved with this? Hey, I'd like to help out. Because a lot of times it's not that we don't want you to help out, or that your elders in the church don't want you to help out. It's that you just literally never thought of it. Yeah. And so you can, on the other side of the coin, you can volunteer. And that's especially true. I keep interrupting. I'm sorry. Nope. That's especially true in larger congregations, right, where it's easy to think, well, there's plenty of people who can do that. But, you know, the Lord might be calling me to do something very specific, not necessarily for others, but even for my own my own uh, spiritual experience, the Lord uses our service to help build up. And so, um, you know, it's important to notice that and find, you know, be willing to find some way of allowing God to work through you. Right. It really does increase our spiritual awareness. And, and I think what you're talking about, uh, Roger, what you're talking about, is really interesting to me. 
is that it kind of ties into the nurture aspect. Oh, absolutely. Because you, you can't, you know, it, it's interesting in, in Scripture, Jesus nurtured those 12 to become disciples, mm-hmm. and then later he empowered those disciples, you know, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so it's like, you know, as we nurture, you know, we're specifically investing in people. And as we invest in people, we start learning what their strengths are. We start learning, you know, a little bit more about them. And and then maybe they're a little more free to act. Or they may feel like, man, you know, I'm really becoming part of this community. They're nurturing me. They're praying with me. They're studying the Bible with me. And, 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 and now there's that sense of, I want to do something. Right. And I've found for me, nurture normally starts in just engaging in a person's life. So maybe somebody's going through a, a difficult relationship or maybe maybe they're just interested in a, in a similar sport that I'm into or whatever it is. And just engaging with them in regular life, not so much, hey, I'm here to teach you something. I am the teacher. You are the student. Yeah. It's just engaging with them in the struggles in the daily life, we all have struggles. We all have things we challenge. But then you find, once you've built up that trust, that's when it starts opening up. And you see, after you've built the relationship, you nurture the people, sometimes beyond whatever is holding them back, then suddenly they, you get to know them well enough to know how to empower them. And they start to maybe even notice things that, that they could be involved in. And suddenly you've gone from your nurture back to your empowerment and they're involved in ministry. Wait, and, the, and, the, and the part here that, it, that I really like is, you know, if we don't think in terms of programs, you know, there, you can be a nurturing person without even, even realizing you're doing it. And I've, I've had people in my life that nurtured me, but they didn't realize they were nurturing me. It wasn't right. like, I'm going to get up today and nurture Roger. No, it's just the way that they interacted with me, the way they supported right. me, uh, the, the words of encouragement, and little bits of advice here and there. Um, so, you know, our church is filled with nurturing people. And they just don't think of it in terms of, you know, that's something I'm doing as a specific task for the Lord. No. It's just the Lord has blessed them with those gifts. And, and I appreciate, you know, it's, it's, and I want to be a blessing. Mm-hmm. You know, God has blessed me, so how can I in turn be a blessing? And, and nurturing is really just passing along the blessing, being involved. And it, and it can be intentional, but it doesn't have to be forced. You know, it shouldn't be forced, right? We don't want it to be forced. Jesus never forced himself on anybody. He gave everybody the option, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you think of the disciples, come follow me. They could have chosen, Mm -hmm. you know, whether to or not. You know, you can't think of the word nurture without thinking of the word gentle. There's a gentleness that comes with true nurturing. You're not not pushing somebody or compelling them or, or, or expecting anything, really. You're just trying to be there for them to support them. And there's a gentleness to that that really appeals to me. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's something that church communities, of course, we need that. We need that gentle spirit. We need that nurturing spirit with one another and, of course, with our community. Right. And when you when you talk about gentle right away, you know, the verse comes to my mind where Jesus says, Learn of me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. For I am meek and, and lowly. And, and that word is actually like that meek and lowly is that gentle you know, spirit that Jesus had. Sure, there were times when it's like knowing who he was talking to, it was kind of like, wait a second, you guys know better yeah. than what you're currently doing. But for the most part, he was always attracting people mm-hmm. because he had something of real substance to share that was going to be transformative and, and not just informative. Right. You know, I think, you know, we live in an age where we, we talk a, a lot about information. You know, we're inundated with information. And what God is about is is transformation. Sure, he informs, but that information he gives us is really for the purpose of of transforming us. He doesn't want us to stay the same because he has such a higher goal. When you look at these these five aspects, the last two really is the outreach. The first three is kind of the inreach. You know, it's like, okay, we need to reflect. We need to remember. We need to understand more about what you were talking earlier about identity. And we need to understand our identity. As, as not just God's denomination, but God's movement, you know, and, and, and I love this because, you know, just like we have the lights around us right now, um, and we're surrounded with light, light is always moving forward, it's electromagnetic waves that are always moving, and, and God wants his church to be always moving, 
you know, developing, growing, increasing, reaching new territories, reaching new places. That light, of course, brings benefit. I mean, there's benefit to light. There's benefit to, yeah, to being able to, to, to push that darkness aside. And there's plenty of darkness in our world, and we know that. We're all a part of that. And, and I think intuitively we all know, and maybe not even intuitively, we're told this, uh, we tell each other this all the time, that we need to be doing evangelism. But oftentimes there's a disconnect, okay, but what does that mean? How, how can I do that? What does that mean for me personally? Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We are so excited to see each and every one of you here, and a special welcome to those joining us on the live stream. We are so happy to have you and very thrilled that we can do this together for Jesus. Let's all stand and let's sing together. There is a Yeah. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, it's, it's really nice when we can come together like this. And I just want to share with you that we actually have 22 churches joining us this morning from around the conference. And I just want to welcome our churches from around the conference. I just want to let you know and say a, a thank you for joining us. And we hope that you are blessed this Sabbath as we are throughout this program. We have the White House Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Louisville First Seventh-day Adventist Church, Martin Memorial, Hendersonville, Gallatin, joining us from Highland, right here, Owensboro, Lebanon, Bordeaux, Middlesboro, Dysburg, Lawrenceburg, Covington, Memphis, Raleigh, Deckard, Parsons, Camden, and Lobelville. And we also, which is exciting, some people heard down in Texas we were doing this and asked if we could record it because they want to use it there. So we're just excited. We want to say a big thank you to the um, Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church for being willing to partner with the conference and host this event. And we're thankful that Pastor Bradshaw is here to share with us on the importance of evangelism. It'll be inspirational, educational, and motivational as we look towards the second coming of Christ. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm welcoming you all, and I'm glad that you're here, and I pray that you will gain a tremendous blessing from what you hear. May God richly bless you. Dear Father, we thank you this morning for your Holy Spirit, and we pray for your Holy Spirit to fall on us that are present this morning, on every one of the congregations that are listening in. We pray for our Holy Tennessee, we might see a revival like we've seen a lot out of that valley of dry bones be just another seminar and say, oh, well, wasn't that great? Help us to take these things to heart, not only in action, in our time to quit just talking, going to I'm now to for we in Jesus Amen. Sabbath, so glad you are all here today. Please join me in your Bible. We're going to read our verse, Ezekiel 47, verse 6 through 8. Ezekiel 47, verse 6 through 8. When he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned, there along the bank of the river were many, many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.
Thank you. Thank you very much. We were blessed. Go on and say amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Blessed to be here, and I trust you are as well. Good to see you. I know we are fighting a, a, a fairly harsh master today. That's the clock. So I'm just going to dive right in here and save greetings and so. Uh, we're here for, I think, the best of reasons this weekend. We're here to discuss evangelism. Uh, you can define that in about a hundred different ways or maybe more. The simplest way to define that is we are here to t talk about sharing Jesus, intentionally sharing Jesus in the hope that God will bring something from that for His glory. So let's dive in this morning. We'll talk about a river. 
will speak to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to be here today on your day, and we're asking for a rich measure of your presence, which probably means asking you to turn up in your own house. But I think that means we're asking you to open wide our hearts that we can receive your presence and your word and your Holy Spirit's guidance. I pray that you would speak to us today. I pray that you would speak through this faulty messenger. And I pray that what is spoken, what is heard, will be for your glory. And we'll be, we'll be able to look back at it and say, yes, happened that day. So we ask your blessing now, please, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen. amen. I grew up in a small town, population around about 5,000 people. And an interesting geographical feature of that town is that in that town, two rivers come together. You don't get that everywhere. And they converge at an area that today is known as, still known as, the Point. The longest river in our country, the Waikato River, flowed this way. And coming in from the west was a smaller, muddier sort of a river known as the, or called, the Waipa. I grew up basically on the banks of that longest river, the Waikato River. My bedroom was 535 feet from the riverbank, 163 meters. If you're wondering how far that is, Usain Bolt could have run that far in about 15 and a half seconds. It's not far. There were two houses between us and the riverbank, but we would simply climb over the back fence into the neighbor's yard walk up a long driveway, and there we would be at the riverbank. The river was a huge part of my life growing up. I learned to swim in that river. We played there. We got up to no good there, climbed the trees, paddled canoes, fished for eels, rowed for the rowing club. It was a major part of my life. I saw it pretty well every day of my life. If you ask me today to list several of my favorite places in the world anywhere within view of that river would be right up near the top of the list. Of course, rivers loom large in the Bible. If I asked you to name a river in the Bible, you would say the river of life. We'll see that in the earth made new. Revelation 22 speaks of that. The Bible speaks of the great river Euphrates, even brought to view in a symbolic sense, in the context of the seven last plagues in Revelation 16, of course, the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized, where, incidentally, my two children were baptized. And there's another river, less well-known. It's the one we want to look at now. We'll go in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 47. Much of the book of Ezekiel involves the prophet speaking very strongly with reference to Judah. Ezekiel comes on the scene after Jerusalem has been attacked by Nebuchadnezzar. It's almost the end of the line for Judah. And Ezekiel catalogs Judah's great sins and sinfulness. It's Ezekiel who's given the vision of sun worship taking place inside the temple. God had some fairly strong things to say through Ezekiel. God himself speaks of the abominations taking place there. Ezekiel relays that. In Ezekiel, judgments are given concerning the surrounding nations. And you'll remember also that in Ezekiel, God appeals to Judah. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away your heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall and do them, we sometimes obscure our picture of the God of righteousness by faith, by hiding behind judgments. We need not do that. God is seen in beauty, in pleading with his people, then restoration. It's in Ezekiel where God speaks of the valley of dry bones, what God will do in placing his spirit in his people them back to spiritual life. So Ezekiel speaks of restoration. Before the end of the book of Ezekiel, there are several chapters going into great detail about the temple. You see that echoed in Revelation. In this, God speaks about true worship and also then 
about the role of God's church in earth's last day. So look at this with me. We'll look at a river found in Ezekiel chapter 47. The chapter starts like this in verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. You see in verse 3 that the waters are initially ankle deep. Then they were waist deep. Then they were too deep for Ezekiel to negotiate without swimming. And then we pick it up in verse 7. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issued out toward the east country and and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, The waters shall be healed. You may have another translation which will tell you that these waters will be made fresh. So the river flows into the sea, and when it does, the salty sea becomes fresh water. I want you thinking about this. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. There shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come there, for they shall be healed. And everything that lives, everything shall live with the river God. And it shall come to pass that the fishes, the fishes eat, shall stand upon it and gain day out of the earth in their name. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. That's significant. Let's not forget that. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, that's food, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, And the fruit thereof shall be for meats, and the leaf thereof for medicine. That's an echo of Revelation, which says, The leaves of the tree of life shall be for the healing of the nations. A river flowed out of the temple. It flowed into the sea, and the waters of the sea were healed. They became fresh. The creatures in that water will all thrive. The fish therein will be plentiful, according to God. The trees growing on the banks of the river will be fruitful, and their fruit will never fail. What could this river be? Could God be talking about flowing out of the temple, bringing health and life and really prosperity to everything it contacts, turning salty water into fresh water, bringing abundance wherever it goes? When you discuss the book of Ezekiel, you can get some fascinating interpretations. But over the years, many commentators, maybe even most, have agreed that these waters flowing forth represent the gospel of Christ. So think with me now. God is seeing a time when the gospel flows from out of the temple and brings healing. Healing to the land. Healing to the world. Healing to all those who will be healed, for we notice in verse 11, there were some places that refused to be healed and would not. Ladies and gentlemen, we see today that God sees a time when the church will carry the gospel to the world. And that that gospel message will be a message of healing and hope. This river portends or is an omen of or prefigures, it represents the church taking the gospel to the world. So let's think about this. What's the Bible telling us? The gospel goes, it brings healing. This is the church doing its work. This is the work of evangelism. The church was not to be like salt in a salt shaker. We are the salt of the earth, getting out of the salt shaker, taking taking a savor, taking taste, taking a preservative quality wherever we go. The church isn't to be a light 
hid under a bushel or a basket. It is to be a light set up in a high place, bringing light to the entire world. This is the church. This is the work of the church. And so we see the church is to be a place of healing and a place of hope. Like a river, it is to bring a healing influence. Think about a river that you've seen. Have you ever seen a river in an arid place? The the arid place can be as arid as arid can be. But along the banks of the river, you will see a ribbon of green. There will be green trees flourishing, healthy foliage lining the river bank, even in the driest environment. And of course, that river provides irrigating water that will turn even the most unlikely place into fertile, productive land. Out of San Diego heading east. I hope you've never driven out of San Diego heading west. If you've ever headed out of San Diego heading east, I mean, you might have gone north or south, but if you went east, you drive out of San Diego and then you get up and you look around at the landscape and say, what in the world? And it is rock and there are vast boulders and you realize nothing could grow here. And then you get over into the Imperial Valley and you marvel at how green and productive that area is. Just add water. And the Imperial Valley produces more than a billion dollars worth of agricultural products every year in a place where there is only three inches of annual rainfall. It's in the Sonoran Desert, for goodness sake. But the Colorado River provides water to irrigate that area and is fertile. Last few days, you almost undoubtedly have eaten something that grew in a desert, made alive by life-giving irrigating water. That's what the church has been called to be, brothers and sisters. Just like a river, taking the gospel everywhere, bringing life. But all too often, and you and I both know this, rivers don't always follow the script. Think now, God uses a river to metaphorically represent the work of the church. And rivers don't always behave like they should. I could tell you about my schoolmates. He was not in any of my classes, but he was in my grade at high school. His name was Heta Parata. Swimming in my hometown in one of those two rivers I told you about, the muddy one. They found his body a couple of days after he went for a swim in the Waipa River. One young fellow did something quite heroic. He spent two days swimming in the Waikato River, just downstream from where I used to play. He went to my school as well. His sister went swimming in the river, and they never did find her. A young man at the time lived over our back fence. He went swimming in the river, dived in, didn't realize the water was so shallow, broke his neck, made a wondrous recovery, but was impaired in some degree for the rest of his life. In other words, a river... Something that brings life and so much blessing can bring bad news or even do great harm. Our river never really flooded, partly because we had hydroelectric dams further up the river, and partly because at least the river was down there. The riverbank went down quite a way. So we never really did get the flooding that you could get. But we all know about the flooding rivers can do and often surprisingly we were all surprised when just a few years ago not far from here because of heavy rainfall a river was it a river even it certainly became a river did tremendous damage and people lost their lives people along the Mississippi River know all about it floods often they've just learned to live with it but no one was ready for what happened in 1927 246 people died 16 million acres were engulfed, 640,000 people were displaced from Illinois to Louisiana. Vicksburg, Mississippi, the river became 80 miles wide. 1997, Red River, which flows north, oddly, out of North Dakota into Winnipeg, Manitoba, ended up being miles wide. 10% of the population of Grand Forks got up and left never to return. Three and a half billion dollars damage. 
There are neighborhoods today where you can drive on perfectly good streets with perfectly good sidewalks and perfectly good driveways. No houses. They're all gone. The, the, the river did its thing. 1937, 70% of Louisville and 20% of Cincinnati underwater. 1889, a dam failed. And the Connemore River surged into Johnstown, Pennsylvania and killed 2,200 people. Rivers, which can also, under certain circumstances, do bad things. Are you hearing me today? You know what I'm saying. There are times that the church, we're talking about evangelism, ladies and gentlemen. We are talking about sharing Jesus. We're talking about the work of the church. We're talking about the church. What the church was raised up to do, by the way, if a bank raised up to make money and save money and loan out loans and it never did it, they'd shut the bank. If a factory was begun to, to, to make widgets, never made any widgets never sold and it ran at a loss and all the employees sat on their hands and the bosses didn't know what they were doing, they'd shut the factory, let somebody else take it over. You know that's what they do. There are times that the church, instead of being like a peaceful, life-giving river, turns into a raging torrent, and there are tragedies. Instead of being helped, people are sometimes, you might say often, hurt in the church, even hurt in the church. And we think about evangelism. Well, let's think about whether we help or hurt. You know what you do at home. You've got company coming over, and so you vacuum the living room. You sweep the kitchen floor. You tidy up the kitchen. I got a friend, and I'm not joking, he's got a German shepherd dog that was trained somewhere in Europe, and it was trained to be a guard dog. When I go and visit him at his house, the dog must be locked away. If it was not, the dog would kill me. I don't say that as an exaggeration. Just so you know it's not personal, is an equal opportunity killer, he'd kill you too. Dog will just kill you. So when they have company over, they put the dog away so the dog doesn't hurt the visitors. Are you hearing me? Protect the visitors. Make the house clean. Cover up the dirt. Straighten up. You put your best foot forward. Friends, we are the church. Consider this with me. We're talking about reaching the world. Do we even know what the church is? I, this is the opening of, of a book that you might own. The book is called The Acts of the Apostles. If you have not read the book in a while, take it down, dust it off, open it up, read the book. Listen, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. I'm going to tell you that again because somebody with good authority tells us what the church is. No need to hold a seminar. No need to have a meeting. It has been decided for us already. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for, can you tell me, service. And its mission is I don't mean seminar, I mean conference. Let's call everybody together. And we're going to deal with a mission statement for the church. We will decide what the mission of the church is. No, we won't. It has already been decided. Its mission is to carry the gospel from the beginning. It has been God's plan that through church shall be reflected to the world. Here we go. His fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. Can you say amen? The church exists so that God can use it to save people. Yet there have been times when the church has been responsible for driving people away from Christ. People are needlessly offended. There are times we are not careful what we say. Ladies and gentlemen, if you at home that will bite the visitor, Lock the dog up while the visitor is here. A visitor does not want to sit in your Bible class and listen to you criticizing another church or arguing with the Bible teacher or generally being offensive. If you're inviting your friends to your house for Thanksgiving and you know that your crazy brother-in-law Larry is going to be there, you go into damage control mode. 
Larry, maybe you should sit in the backyard and eat your Larry wants to know why. It's, it's one degree out there. Well, 34 degrees outside. No, no, Larry, you'll be good out there. Larry, we have company coming over, so don't you dare talk about politics. And don't you dare talk about religion. And don't you dare talk about your time in Vietnam because all you ever do is talk about the graphic, awful stuff. No, Larry, no. We want to make a good impression, Larry. We want our friends to come back, Larry. We do that at home. Let's do that in the church. Every church has a crazy brother-in-law named Larry in it. And yet we sit in Sabbath school and we just kind of shrug our shoulders when Larry runs the visitors off. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't want to come on too strong here, but it might be time to run Larry off. I've been in evangelistic meetings where I have seen the church troublemaker sidle up to a visitor. Hey, how you doing? And you know what? I don't even apologize for it. Bill, here. Hey, Bill. I'm right between Bill and the visitor. Bill, I need to talk to you over here right now. Oh, you do, Pop? What do you need to talk to me about? Honestly, I'm not so sure. But out. We've got to save the world. Now, don't get me wrong, God does the saving. But the gospel to the world. We need our churches to be a safe place. And we need people to be cognizant at all times of why we are here and what we have been called to do and how we get it done. We need to think more in church about why we do what we do. What do our visitors think? Are we making them welcome? Are we leaving a good impression? Are they seeing Jesus in us? Folks come to the church where I go to church, and I, I had someone say, I said, so how do you pick our church? There's 25 churches or so in town. Why'd you come here? Well, I went visiting churches, and not one to me at any of the churches. I came here. All people would do was speak to me. It was easy. I mean, thank the Lord. We must have had the good greeters on, uh, on, that, on that Sabbath. When people come, we love them. We make a fuss about them. I, I, will, I will tell you this, and you, you understand the spirit in which I mean this, but our visitors are more important than you. They just are. Now, I'm not saying you are unimportant, but you're not as important as a lost person who is finding his or her way to Christ and the truth. They become our absolute priority at that time. And when folks come around, I'm not just talking about when visitors come to the church. Of course, there's another aspect of this. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I speak four times today. I wish I could hit every point in one. I'm going to leave many things unsaid. This afternoon, it becomes a little more nuts and bolts. This morning, or uh, and, and so forth. We got to think to those people that come in and out of our doors. Now, I don't mean, hey, they love this sort of music, so let's change everything. And be No, that, that never worked. It doesn't, it didn't, and it won't. It never worked. But having said that, we do need to think about why we do what we do and how we do what we do and, 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 and why we say what we say. We can sometimes be careless we can sometimes be, but you know what? I know that I'm talking about visitors, and there are people who are, are there right now and saying, but we don't get visitors. Well, that's why today is happening, so we can change all of that as a result of being here today. When was the last time someone invited themselves over to your place for dinner? Just said, good to see you. I'm coming over tonight. Unless it was that brother-in-law, Larry, that doesn't typically happen, does it? If we want more visitors in church, we've got to actually invite people to come to church. Invite them. Give them something to come to. Have something to invite them to. Invite them to hear the Word of God. Invite them to learn about the Bible in a way that is appropriate for where they are in life. To get to know you. Invite them to see the character of Jesus being reflected in the people in the church. We shouldn't be doing what we do just for us. Instead, we do what we do so that people who don't know what we know and don't know who we know can have the best possible opportunity to know Jesus. A lady was greeting at the door one day. God bless her. Good morning. Here's a bulletin. Good morning. Here's a bulletin. You know how greeters do. 
Oh, she said to one young lady. The lady was covered in black, young lady, about 19, dressed in black, top of her head to the bottom of her feet, black, everything. Black fingernails, black lipstick, black everything. She looked like she had just stepped out of somebody's migraine headache. And the dear sister at the door did what any self-respecting greeter would do. She said, oh, honey, you can't come in here dressed like that. Oh, no. Oh, you're welcome, but you can't come in here dressed like that. You need to go home, get changed. The 19-year-old girl had a friend with her dressed the same. You need to go home, get changed, come on back, and that, that, that'd be fine. But please, sweetheart, get dressed, would you? Would you, would you change? Now, I know that's an extreme case, but it's also a true case, as true as I'm standing here. Our answer to that is no, no, no. Bring them in. Bring them, your poor, your tired, your huddled masses. Bring them, the goths and the drunks and the drug users. Bring them, tell them, mikasa, sukasa, you are welcome here, you will be loved here. We can't afford to offend people. We got to love people. We can't afford to ignore people. We got to make them feel like they just came home. I was standing in the foyer of a church once, small foyer, small. The church was renting uh, a building in a mall. I will tell you, the church grew out of about seven people to about 700, and this is one of the reasons why. I was standing with the pastor over to one side, and he said, oh, these two people... Uh, looked like a mother and a daughter. They're new. We've never seen them here before. He said, watch what happens. So the greeters at the door were all over them. How are you doing? Great to see you. First time? Oh, we're so glad. Well, here's the bulletin and here's something else and tell us your names and so on. Then it was like a tag team. There were some more greeters over near the door leading into the sanctuary. And the first group said, Elizabeth, or whoever the other greeter's name was, I want you to meet Ethel and, and Madeline. Meet them. And so they met, and did you say 10th Street? Oh, my, I'm on 11th. Really? No kidding. Oh, so, oh maybe our husbands even work together. Oh, my. And then, as God is my witness, I heard one of those women say to the other, as they were walking into the sanctuary, one said to the other, I am I have finally found a church home. Hadn't met the pastor, hadn't heard a sermon, hadn't read the 28 fundamental beliefs, but she was home because she was treated like family. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to share Jesus with somebody else, the first work has got to be here in my heart. If we're going to shed, if we're going to win, if we're going to reach the community, if we're going to impact the people living around us, then God must impact me first. It has to happen. You can go to churches and be ignored when we should have decided long ago we'll make it a big deal about everybody who comes. We'll let people know who we are, what we stand for, why. What if your church just disappeared? If, if tomorrow, when you drove by, if there was nothing there, just an empty lot, would your community care? Would your community feel the difference? Would your community say, oh, that's too bad because, because those are the people that, would they even care? I read recently where a man, true story, got a job as a fake shopper. Large store, there was construction outside, so it wasn't easy for people on the outside to even know there was anything going on on the inside. So they hired some fake shoppers just to be in the shop, in the store, and to mill around looking like they were interested in something. So that if you happen to be on the street, you'd notice them and you might say, got to see what's going on in there. So they gave the idea that on the inside, they were having a great time. They were having fun. They were glad to be where they were. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it make a difference if the people on the inside of the church actually, they were glad to be there as though being in that church was the best thing ever, as though being in that church had positively impacted their lives? 
Don't you think if Jesus is in your heart, it will show if Jesus really takes up residence in our churches? That's got to shine out. If a church is like a river taking the gospel message to the world, flowing out of the heart of Jesus himself, keep in mind there are all different kinds of rivers. I stood on the banks of the Ganges in India. It's a great big long river, they were the Ganges. And it's, it's revered in Hinduism as a god. The river itself is a god. Man, you don't want to get too close. One of the most polluted rivers in the world. It's polluted. If you drank a thimble full of that water, you would be as sick as a dog. In 1969, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio actually caught fire. It was so polluted, the river caught fire. At about the same time in London, England, the River Thames was declared by scientists to be biologically dead. If taking the gospel to the world is depicted by Ezekiel as a river flowing out of the sanctuary, then friend, we must covenant right now that our churches will be healthy places, that our churches will actually want to do the work. Listen, listen, listen. Just being a place that you like going doesn't even mean your church is healthy. Doesn't mean it. Because you come and you know the folks. And you might have four or five different families that you're all friendly with. Or maybe it's your own family. And every week is like a family reunion. That doesn't mean it's a healthy church that other people want to come to. It does not necessarily mean it is not. But our churches ought to be healthy. They ought to be places people want to come. Always want to be. I certainly don't believe your church is like the Ganges River, but we want to be intentional. The fact that church just goes on, what does that mean? Does it mean that some of our churches might simply be going through the motions? Could we be caught in a rut? No. Maybe some other denomination. Not us. But what would it mean if we were caught in a rut? We might not even know. Because we might not ever have stopped and really thought about it. That in Revelation chapter 3, the challenge isn't that the church is just awful. The challenge is that people think they're fine when really they're not. Just don't really understand spiritual Too many of our churches are either unhealthy or plagued by unhealthy people. Someone with the coronavirus, quarantined. Towns are being sealed off. People are asked to stay indoors. Infected people wear masks. Sometimes it seems we ought to put masks on some church members or maybe muzzles to prevent their sickness infecting others. Look at what God said about people who are not yet church members. Isaiah this time in Isaiah 56. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Are we even praying for our community? When did we last pray? Lord, grow the church. Lord, reach our town. And I don't mean that nice old lady who prays about everything and the pastor because that's his job. I mean, when did we as a church really take it on board to say, Lord, there are people around us going down to Christ's graves. We drive past their homes every Sabbath morning coming to church. It doesn't seem like we are impacting them. We got to pray. Pray that God would make this place a light and a healing river so that anybody up against this place, whether they meet one of the church members in town, and I don't mean just this congregation, but all of the congregations that we're dealing with today. Someone who drives by is going to felt drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. Somebody who encounters you in food line is going to say something different about that person. When Jesus has us, you know that God wants to work. God wants to see our churches overflowing. It's not because we are employing the wrong method that we're doing. It's because we are not given fully to Christ and he doesn't have us to use us like he wants to use us. When he has us, he will shine out and somebody's going to say, not sure what it is about that woman, but there's something about her. You've met him. I remember meeting a lady, Cole Porter, when I was a student. And I said, ma'am, I don't even need to ask you if you are a Christian. What church are you from? It was like Jesus lived in her life. 
our churches be like that? Let our people be like that? Think about this thing in Ezekiel's prophecy. The river flowed. The gospel going to the world is depicted as a flowing river, not as a lake or a stagnant pond. I had a river in that direction, but across the road from our house was a gully for sand for the railroad decades before. And if there was a lot, a lot, a lot of rain, water collected in that gully, and it would stagnate. Flowing water, that's okay water doesn't smell good it doesn't look good when we don't go as a church we don't we stagnate and we don't look good and we don't smell good Jesus said or if he was thinking of Ezekiel he might have said flow therefore and make disciples of all nations you are my witnesses says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people. Light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Isaiah chapter 42. We're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. The church is God's fortress. It's his city of refuge. And please, to you, you don't have to like it the church, but you do have to remember that the church is the apple of God's eye. It is the one object upon this earth in spite of himself upon which Christ bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. We want to build it up. We want to grow it. Best for it. Recently somebody it was bad. The church had done something wicked and I mean the church. This is that person was doing the devil's work I'm bad about your mother you find out your mother used to be a hooker when she was 19 years old what are you gonna do <laughs> guess what everyone you're gonna put it on Facebook my mother was a harlot at one time oh man how many likes can I get for that are you gonna do that you're going to keep that a secret. And if somebody ever says, I I heard something about your mother, you will tell them to mind their own business. You go telling the world our dirty laundry. Who are you helping? Not God. Not the people you tell. And certainly not yourself. What do you expect from the church? It's made up of people. Let me, let me put an even on it. It's made up of people like you. And you're expecting perfection? Conference president fumbles the ball, and so you're going to put the boot in? What would you do that for? And by the way, maybe he didn't fumble the ball. Maybe you just see it as a fumble. Pray about it. You might have a concern that you share with somebody in private. But why in the world are you going to shout it from the rooftops? Just dogs. Why would you do that? No, ladies, this is a time for building it up, not for tearing it down. Devil wants you to see the bad, wants you to see the hypocrites and the insincere and the people with problems. Thank God we got some hypocrites in this church. Thank God we got people with problems in this church. Thank God we have insincere people in the church. That's where they need to be. And maybe if they hang around long enough, Jesus will really get hold of them and straighten them out. If we don't have hypocrites in the church, it's clear the church isn't doing its job. Because Jesus didn't say, get all the perfect people and bring them in. He said, go out on the highways and byways and bring in the sinners. God has called us to be faithful to the mission of the church. And what is it? The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. That's why we are here. I visited a little church recently. and by little, I don't know when I got there if there were even 10 people there. And if there were many more than that, there couldn't have been many. Nobody knew I was coming. I didn't even know if I would know anyone there. It turns out I did people there. I went and turned out the guy with the pregnant young wife, he was preaching, and I didn't think much of it. And I, 
but it had been a while. He stood up to preach, and I finally realized who it was. About 15 years earlier, I had been not far from there conducting an evangelistic series. A young woman, a backslider, to put it politely, decided in her heart that she was going to invite her whole family to come to the evangelistic meetings. Whole family. Including her brothers who... I remember seeing them sitting during, was it there, during the evangelistic meetings. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember hearing that the brothers had been baptized. The husband had been baptized too. The parents came back. Whole family came into the church. Whole family. One of them became a pastor as an ordained minister today. One of them became a missionary. One of them is a healthcare professional. And that young man who stood up and prayed, he's a layman preaching, was baptized. Preaching today because somebody years ago had a burden to reach out to him. This is the work of the church, to take the gospel, to issue an invitation. There was no hectoring. There was no haranguing. There were no threats. There was no physical it was an invitation. And when you invite somebody and here where they can sit in the atmosphere of God, where they can hear the word of God, grow in the love of God, great things happen. Great things happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called us. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of souls. Our mission to take the gospel to the world. Let's be that river, that healing river. When you bump up against salt water, I want to see the salt water become fresh. I want the, 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 the gospel to flow out of here deep and wide, powerful, giving life. We can be that when Jesus comes. God can do that work so that the church is a mighty force for good, a power for the gospel he wants us if he has us he can do that work what do you say shall we let him have us i think we should let's pray our father in heaven you liken the church to a river taking the gospel to the world oh lord bringing life bringing healing bringing bringing hope and so use us please I think it's easy to confess before you today our inadequacy, and we don't always like to do that because after all, we're doctors and teachers and lawyers and accountants and, 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 and bus drivers and perfectly capable people. But Lord, we must be honest with you. The last time this church was filled to overflowing without there being a funeral or a concert See, Lord, that's the best we can do. And now we need you to do the best that you can do. Give us your grace. Do a great thing. The harvest is great. Let our churches be healthy and life-giving. And let that transformative work begin in my heart. We thank you today. Bless us throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.